Right, ready to go. Okay. Got it. Okay, good. Uh, let me dismiss this. Okay, so uh, I'll. This is a lot of stuff that I prepared, and I don't intend to go through all of it. You know, feel free to ask me questions if I'm going too fast. Uh, as I, I told Jay, if you want to have uh, the slides, I'm happy to give the slides to you. Uh, or if you just want the references, you know, please, please go ahead. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So neural neural mechanics, right? So we typically, you know, this is the type of networks that we're going to think about. Most neural networks are going to talk about, talk about cells in the brain. We think uh, neurons are the cells that part, some of the cells that constitute our brain, and those are they are electrically active. We think of them as the cells that carry information, right? Do the information processing, do the computations in the brain. There's many other types of cells in the brain, but those are the ones that I will focus on, right? Those are the only, the only ones. There's glia and other types of cells in the brain that are also very important, but I will just talk about neurons and networks of neurons in, in, in the following. The neurons can be roughly uh, divided into uh, ex excitatory and inhibitory neurons. As I said, neurons are electrically, electrically active, which means that they uh, fire action potentials, which are short excursions in their membrane voltages. Those then travel down to neurons and cause uh, either a depolarization if a neuron is excitatory or a hyperpolarization, meaning a downturn in a postsynaptic uh, neuron in, a, in the voltage of a postsynaptic neuron if the neuron is inhibitory, right? Excitatory neurons tend to excite other neurons, inhibitory neurons tend to inhibit other neurons down the stream. So that's a very basic, so there's many, many different types of neurons, but it's kind of very basic separation of the neurons into two classes. Um, now, again, as I said before, neurons fire action potentials, and frequently we think that uh, we characterize the neural code by some characteristics of the sequence of action potentials that have been fired. Okay, so this, these sequences of action potentials are very variable, and I'll talk a little bit about this more. And so we need to uh, characterize them using uh, different forms of statistics. The easiest form of statistics is just to, uh, to define a window. Here's about a 50 millisecond window, roughly. Uh, you count the number of spikes in that particular window, and then you slide it down right? And then you count the number of spikes in many different windows. You can have disjoint window or just a sliding window. It doesn't matter. And you compute the average number of spikes per, in this case, 50 milliseconds. You typically count this number of spikes per second. And that's the rate at which a neuron fires. You can also quantify the variability of the neuron, right? And instead of just computing the mean number of spikes in that window, you can compute the variance of the number of spikes in that neuron. So that tells you how variable it is, right? And so the more regular, the more periodic the spiking of a neuron is, the smaller the variance is going to be. Now, the variance typically uh, depends on the rate as well, right? The more spikes you have in a window, uh, the higher the variance is typically going to be. And so what's usually used is a coefficient of variation, which is the square root of the variance standard deviation divided by the mean. And that's something that doesn't depend on it. So it's a, it's a quantity that doesn't, it's, that's, uh, that, uh, that doesn't have any units. And for a Poisson spike train, you know, if you're familiar with Poisson uh, processes, that quantity is one. So that would be kind of, you can have uh, CVs that are larger than one, you can have CVs that are smaller than one, but kind of the Poisson process is a good yardstick. And if you look in the brain, and this is something that people have looked at, you know, for, for many, many years, even in the 60s, if you look at the brain, if you look at the cortex, what you find is that many, many cells in very different areas of the brain, not all, but in many different areas of the brain, uh, of the cortex, uh, fire very irregular, right? They fire with CVs around one. Right, so this is much more. You know, if you look at them, they will not. It's going to be much more like uh, like what I've had on the previous slide than a regular spiking pattern, right? And um, now, if you just create a single cell in your model, just write down whatever model you want. Take a single cell, and uh, just it doesn't really even matter what you can do. Hodgkin Huxley, whatever. If you looked at these models before, and you and you just bombarded with inputs. What you're going to see is not such an irregular activity. What you typically going to see is a very regular activity. In fact, the more inputs you have, the more small inputs you have, the more regular the activity is. And if you think about it for a second, it's really due to the law of large numbers. Kind of what you get is really just a mean uh, activity there. And it, it, I'm gonna there's, there's a caveat here, but typically what you're going to do to what you get if you just try to do it naively is a very regular output. And this is something that people not noticed in the, in '93, and they said like, look, this activity that we're seeing in in the brain is really not 
what you would expect in a particular model. And if you just kind of model things naively, so what's going on? Why are things, why are these neurons firing so irregularly? So one, one thing you can say, well, maybe they have a lot of internal noise, right? Maybe there is, the neurons are just really, really noisy, right? There's a lot of internal noise independent from every neuron. That's why they're so irregular, right? But that's not the case. So for, here's an experiment from 1995, mine and Sinowski, very famous paper. And if you, uh, I'll just concentrate on the right, on the right figure just to, to make things simple. If you inject a current into the neuron, right? So this is what you see here below. And let me actually just make sure that I have an annotate here. Uh, the spotlight, the vanishing pen. Okay, all right, let me go back. Sorry about that. Um, oh, I can go back. Oh, let's see. Either, either I can move back and forth or I can have the spotlight. Do you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's really all right, good. Um, so you, if you have this input, this is this irregular input into the cell, right? And if you repeat this many times, in this case, 25 different trials, mm -hmm. what you find is that the neuron responds every time very regular, right? It, it gives you almost the same output, the, the, uh, the spikes. This is what you see here in this a picture above is actually 25 different traces right on top of each other. And they all lie right on top of each other, meaning that the neuron responds every time almost exactly the same to the same input, right? So it seems to suggest that internal noise is not really what's it at play here, right? It's something more than internal noise that, that causes the variability in the response. And uh, another thing that you also see in these networks is, so this is a nice experience, this is a little complicated, but I'll, I'll just kind of maybe the, the part A is the main part here to kind of think about. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a beautiful experiment by Alex Reyes in 2003. He actually used the single neuron to simulate what would happen in a feed forward network. And a feed forward network is really almost the same type of network mm -hmm. that you would that you would see that you saw 10 years later or mm -hmm. you know nine, eight, nine years later in deep neural networks, right? And it's it's a very similar, but now with a real cell, all right. So he created a, a real cells. And what you see if you do that, if you take just activity in this network, uh, if you create the activity in this network, what you find is that. In this, if you also do a simulation, what you find is that in the first layer, the activity is very irregular. Right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of noisy. You provide different, you provide independent inputs to the different cells here that fired independently. Mm -hmm. But as you go across the layer, so you take the output of the first layer, you project it to the second layer, right? There's some sort of footprint on the second layer. It's random connections on the second layer. It doesn't really matter how you do it. It's pretty much any way you do it, it's always going to come out the same. And uh, you, you know, you take the output of the second layer, you feed it to a third layer. There's no feedback connections. Everything's just feed forward. The activity becomes more and more regular as you go across layers, right? Wow. You can start it again. So, okay, good. Uh, so yeah. as you, as, when you get to the 11th layer, when you get uh -huh. to the 11th layer, the, you get almost periodic behavior, right? So there's no noise and the CV is almost one. Right? Wow. And so this is really mysterious, right? So you get... We have, so I, I think I have the, uh, so rhythmic synchrony is the default state for feed forward networks. Again, you can think about any model you take here, Hodgkin, Huxley, um, you know, uh, a simple one, integrate and fire. This is going to happen if you have a feed forward network, almost guaranteed, right? Until you, unless you do something, something special, right? Oh. But it's again, it's not something you see in the, in the cortex. In the cortex, if you look and you measure the coefficient of fair, oh, sorry, the uh, cor uh, correlation coefficient, not the coefficient, mm -hmm. the correlation coefficient, which measures how correlated the activity of different cells is, what you would expect if neurons are really correlated, if they're almost synchronous, you would expect a, uh, uh, a correlation coefficient of about one. Mm -hmm. But what you actually see are correlation coefficients of about 0 0.1, 0 0.1, so 10 times smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the activity, it's almost uncorrelated. It's not, ex it's not completely uncorrelated, but it's very, very weakly correlated. Okay, so you know what do you have? So neurons respond reliably to many inputs and receive many inputs, implying CV should be close to zero. Right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the first part we talked about here. But if you look at the responses in cortical neurons, the response is very variable. Mm -hmm. The CV is about one, right? Mm -hmm. And neurons in a feed-forward network synchronize with low CV. So if you take mm -hmm. a feed-forward network in the way that we talked about before, you get a very low CV. Mm -hmm. And you get very synchronous activity, right? But again, cortical neurons do nothing of the type, right? Cortical neurons are very regular in their firing. They're very, and cortical networks are very asynchronous, right? And so this, we talk, this is about the mid, uh, you know, the first questions about the mid 90s that people were 95, 90, about 95, 96, but 94, 95, that people are thinking about this. 
the second question a little bit later, uh, early 2000, minutes of 2000s, right? So how do you, how do we get a network, you know, that, that consistently gives you this answer to these questions, right? And and this is really uh, the question, so by which mechanisms does a connected driven cortical neural network produce variable asynchronous responses of the type that you see in the cortex, right? And the answer, right, the answer that people came up with is balance, balance and ex excitation and inhibition. Right. And so I'll try to kind of give you, I'm not going to be able to completely describe, but I'll try to at least to tell you a little bit about what balance is. Right. So, and balance is something that you actually see in the cortex. Right. It's not something that's made up by theorists, it's actually something that is frequent. If you observe balance, and I'll tell you what it is, it's something you frequently see in the cortex. Right. And so, again, let's go to the, to the network that we talked about. We have excitatory neurons, these are the little pyramids, red pyramids that we, uh, that we have in this picture, and inhibitory, inhibitory neurons, which is a little blue circles that we have in this picture, right? So, you know, typically when you put the network together, you put the excitatory neurons in one population, the inhibitory neurons in another population, we'll just have two populations, you can have more subclasses and so on, we're not gonna talk about this. And you have a bunch of um, connectivities, right? So JEE would be the connectivity between the uh, excitatory neurons, JIE would be the connectivity between, from the inhibitory to the excited neurons and so on. And it's also an external population, typically, especially for a classical theory of balanced network, Networks have an external population is actually really important, uh, which is actually one of the big failings of theory. I can tell you a little bit more uh, at oh, the end of failings. That's one of the things you kind of have to worry about when you when you work in the theory. And, and remember, the N in and NX and inhibitory and excitatory are going to be two numbers that we're going to kind of keep in mind. Those are the numbers of excitatory number of inhibitory neurons. A lot of the theory, uh, the balance theory, the classical balance theory, works in the limit of large networks. Right, that works in the limit as the number of networks, number of uh, neurons in the network that verges to infinity. The networks become larger and larger. Right, so n n will always stand for the number of neurons in the network. All right, uh, the particular model that I'm going to talk about mostly here is the integrating fire leaky integrating fire neuron. As I'm going to talk about this in the talk, uh, this model I'm going to use in the talk. Uh, it's, I'm going to use a variation of which is called the, which is a nonlinear version of which is called the exponential integrating fire model. The details don't matter. A lot of the theory is works regardless of the particular model that you use. But you know, if you want to implement, if you're going to play with this, is kind of what you start with. Uh, you have a linear membrane dynamics, and it's usually su supplemented by a reset. In other words, the input is integrated linearly by the neuron. There's a leak term, right, which kind of makes the neuron decay back to the voltage of the neuron decay back to zero. But if it reaches threshold, the neuron fires an action potential. You just kind of put it in by hand. It doesn't fire. It's on its own. We kind of put it. We assume that when a threshold is reached, it fires an action potential, and the voltage is then reset back to zero, and the it starts over and over again, right? And so that is the kind of the classical uh, leaky integrated fire neural model. That's, you can have that in the back of your mind as you think about these simulations. Okay, so um, what you so one way to think about this now is to, as I said before, take a single cell, right? A single putative cell, maybe I'll go a couple of slides back. Think about, oops, too far. Think about the representative cell right here. That we talked about before uh, in this network we talked about before and take think about the number of inhibitory cells and number of excitatory cells diverging to infinity right and that's not an unreasonable limit if you look at cells in the cortex they receive many many inputs they receive uh, thousands or tens of thousands of inputs each core each cell in the cortex in some other areas of the brain not so many but in the cortex the neurons do receive a large number of inputs from other cells right so th this the, the idea that you have many many inputs to a single cell is not outlandish and when you so here is what would happen right so here is a single cell if you have just an input so here's the excitatory input to a single cell and inhibitory input to a single cell if you just have one excited one prehibitory input and j is the strength is how large those inputs are what you see is the memory potential is going to swing up and down Right, it's going to go each time you get it, it diver, you know, diverges downwards. If you have an inhibition, it diverges upwards. If you have an excitation, and so on. Right, as the number of in, uh, input neurons grows, right, mm -hmm. you typically what you do is you scale the each of the inputs downwards. Oh, right, the wow. more inputs you have, the weaker you make them. Right, to kind of preserve the the balance between the wow. number of inputs and the, and the number of cells, and it's going to be critical actually. How you do that is going to be very very important. Right, this is, good. this is the limit we talk about here. N goes to infinity, the number of cells goes to infinity. J, the strength of the individual inputs oh. is gonna to go to zero. That's gonna be crucial what we do here. Okay, so here we have 10 cells with an input that's 10 to the minus one half, 
Okay. I see. So what you see here is that this is much more variable. And now we go to a hundred cells, right? So here, the input from a hundred cells is going to be effectively the rate of that input is going to be a hundred times the rate of the input from a single excitatory cell. It's important that the individual cells that provide the inputs are uncorrelated. So that that's the theory works in that case. So in the, these are the think of these as possible processes, uncorrelated possible processes, right? And so when you sum them up, you just get a possible process with n times the rate of the individual possible process. And the same thing for the uh, excitation for the inhibition, right? You, you effectively get when you have a hundred of each, you effectively get a hundred times the rate that you have all, all the way on the left hand side where you have one of them, right? And you have in this case you scale the um, the uh, the input strength by 10 to the minus one. So by the square root of the number of cells, that square root is gonna be kind of, seems weird right now, but it's gonna be actually really important. And what you get kind of, <clears throat> and maybe in retrospect, it's not surprising, you, you can use a functional limit theorem or you know different kind of more physics approaches. What you get is that the membrane potential actually starts behaving like an SD, right? And this is again, due to this uncorrelatedness of the inputs, right? right. So. The and the, the SD that it that it got, that it behaves if you have a leaky integrating fire that that it, uh, that it uh, obeys if you have a leaky, leaky integrating fire neuron is a very simple uh, SD. It's just a uh, Ornstein Ullebeck process uh, with the threshold. Right. Remember, we keep the threshold. Right? Every time you hit the threshold, you spike, fire a spike, and you you uh, you go back to zero. The important thing here are the two quantities that you have. So the mu. Right, that's the mean input, and it consists. The mean input consists of three things, um, or several several terms. So nu x is the firing rate of every presynaptic neuron. So we we can or we can think of it as the average firing of all the neurons, or if you have just a homogeneous population, it's the firing rate of every single of of a uh, presynaptic neuron in the population of excited presynaptic neuron in the population. Nx is the number of excitatory presynaptic neurons in the population. Jex is the strength of the connection. Nu n is, and now you have three terms that are exactly the same, but for a condition, right? So that's the mean is, and it doesn't make, it makes sense, right? The, it's proportional to the firing rate that comes in, the number of neurons that contribute, and to the strength of the input of each individual, right? right? That makes sense, right? And you can also compute the, the, uh, the term that um, that multiplies sigma squared multiplies the, uh, 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 the the diffusion term right here, right? Sigma, sigma is a diffusion term. Sigma squared is the size of the diffusion. You can compute that, and it comes out to be very very similar, except that Jex the the strength, the synaptic strength is squared, right? And you know if you've done these type of computations, that should kind of be familiar, right? It should you 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 can probably see where 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 this is coming from, right? right. So, so, can I can I have yes yeah. yeah yeah yes can please I, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So so yeah in here yeah you do you consider the fully connected network? No 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 no. So all Not I've done connected. right all I've done right here right. Good question good question. I'm just thinking about a single cell, right? And all mm -hmm. I've done. Uh, or I'm, all I've really talked about right here is to take the limit of the single cell right here, right, a representative cell, as the number of input, as the number of uh, cells that project to it, right, goes to infinity. That's all. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, you can argue, is it a fully connected network? Well, you know, you could think of it because the effect of the of the cell on all the other cells is going to be vanishing in the limit of many cells. Right, so you could think even if it's a connected network, it's going to be okay, as long as the activity in the network is remains uncorrelated. Right, as long as the activity in the network, as the n goes to infinity, becomes uncorrelated, it doesn't really matter if it's a uh, if it's a feed forward situation where I take a cell and I take the input from a different population, or if it's a recurrent network. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but you have to show that the activities are correlated. That's actually a, a, a pretty, you know, that's a, a nature paper itself, actually, you know, to show that the activities are correlated. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I'll, I probably won't get to it, but it's actually one of the things that I, that I So, all right, so this is the important thing. So, all right, so uh, this is the member potential dynamics, mm -hmm. member potential increment, right, the, the deterministic dynamics in, in uh, pink and stochastic dynamics in green right here, right? Okay, and we talked about the mu and the sigma, mm -hmm. right? And so 
there's diff so the crucial thing here, right? This is kind of where where the idea of balance comes. The crucial thing here is that you can you can get this limit j goes to zero and n goes to infinity. You can get that limit in many different ways, right? One one way to do that is to have j x and j n. So those are the strengths of excitation and inhibition. Uh, be uh, inversely proportional to the number of neurons in the mm -hmm. in the network. Right. So then as n, the number of neurons goes to infinity, then j goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Right. And j bar here is just a constant. Just think of j bar as a constant. Mm -hmm. Right. Just think of j bar as a constant. If you go back to the equations that we talked about before, right? So with mu and sigma, uh -huh. this is this equation right here. If you go back, if you take this limit, right, what's going to happen is that mu is going to be independent of the size of the system, right? But sigma is going to go to zero. Nice. Right. And in that case, because if you, you know, because J, because because of the JEX squared, right? This JEX squared, if you scale it like that, you're going to have an NEX squared in the in the denominator, the mm -hmm. NEX and the NEX, that's going to cancel one of the powers of NEX, but you're going to have an NEX in the denominator, right? Mm -hmm. As as the number of cells in the network grows, sigma, the variability, is going to go to zero, right? So that tells you that if you buy my argument that this stochastic uh, stochastic differential equation is right, as a good approximation of the limit as n goes to infinity, that tells you that in the limit as n goes to infinity, this network becomes deterministic, right? mm -hmm. because there's no variability at all, right? And so that's not what we want, right? Mm -hmm. But if you scale it in a different way, if you scale it like if you noticed before, I, I use a slightly different scale. So you use it you, if you scale by the square root of n, right? The square root of n. Again, j bar is just a constant. Then what happens is that sigma squared becomes independent of system size, right? Sigma squared, now if you do the same thing, right? you plug these JEX and JIN, you uh -huh. plug them in here, you square the, you know, the square root squared gives you an NEX that cancels the NEX, mm -hmm. and sigma squared becomes in, roughly independent of system size as N goes to infinity, right? So your fluctuations remain constant as your network size grows. What happens to the mean input, however, right? Uh, and sorry, by the way, this is, I should have said this. So this is not made up. If you look in the literature, there's actually good evidence that this is how the neural uh, connectivity strength scales. Okay. Uh, so, but what about the mute? What about the average? So if you look at this number, right, again, uh, this is what you get if you plug in the J bar EX divided by square root of N. We had an NEX in the numerator divided by square root of NEX in the denominator. That gives you a square root of any x in the numerator, right? Or square root of any e i n, the number of inhibitory square root of inhibitory and a square root of excitators in the numerator. There's three things that can happen as, as the number of neurons goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. If the excitation is stronger than inhibition, the average kind of excitation, effective excitation is stronger than inhibition, this diverges to infinity. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a network that explodes that's just going to fire without control, right? It's going to be epileptic. If the have the opposite of equality, then that goes to negative infinity, and you're going to have a network that doesn't do anything because the inhibition is is effectively infinitely stronger than the excitation. Hmm. So the only thing that happens where it's in, anything interesting is where the excitation and inhibition are exactly balanced, hmm. right? Where where the jex nu ex j, which is the average effective excitation, and the average effective inhibition are balanced, right? Where they're, they're actually zero. Right where mu is zero, right? That's the only that's the only solution in the network that actually gives you anything interesting. Now you know you can ask you know the, the best about, thing to ask. What about the square root nex and square root nin? To in this equality, do we need the square root number of the excitatory neuron? Yeah. So this is this is the scaling right here, right? So we have the square root. This uh -huh. comes from from assuming this is an assumption, right? Uh -huh. You assume. If that this is that. a scaling that uh -huh. you assume that the strength of the coupling scales like the square root of n, uh -huh. right? square root of the number of excitatory square. Uh -huh. When you plug this back into the equation, oh, right, 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 right. So yeah, right. that makes sense to me. But at the that, next slide, the uh, yeah, mu becomes zero. This is what you holding equal together, isn't it? 
Do, yeah, when 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 you get exactly this balance, right? Oh, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. What 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 are yeah? So we are assuming there's a rough. There is a. Same. You do have to make sure that these numbers also are are scaled in the right way, right? Okay. But okay. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. I should have probably added the, the ends here, right? That that the number of neurons also plays a role. Mm -hmm. Good good point. Good point. Yes, thank you. Yeah, right. But that's the important thing is that the effective inputs. Uh, to the cell have to balance. Otherwise, this term right here, this mu is going to merge either to infinity or negative infinity. You're going to have epileptic activity or you're going to have no activity at all, right? Yeah. And if the balance exactly to zero, then the equation that we started with, this equation right here, it's minus VDT, sigma DW is completely, the activity is completely driven by noise, right? There's no mu, the activity is completely going to be driven by noise, nice. right? And that is the balance state. That is what's called a balanced state. It gives you very regular activity. Wow. It actually turns out to be, uh, if you, this is much more than, than I'm going to talk about here on the talk. It turns out to be a chaotic state. You can compute on the Apollo exponents. It's, a, it's a, actually a chaotic state. In a deterministic network, it becomes a chaotic state. And, it's the, and this solution, the solution at zero is actually stable. Right. You could say, well, you know, it wouldn't matter if that's an unstable solution, even if it's the most interesting one, if it's unstable, it doesn't right. matter. But it turns out to for under some conditions, this particular solution becomes stable in the network. Right. And and so that is the balanced state. Mm. As I said, there's a little bit more. Uh, I, I didn't talk about why it's uncorrelated. There's a separate paper talking about correlations. So here is a. Um, Here's a list of some references. There, there's a lot written about this. Uh, I'm happy to share this. This is actually the original paper by Van Rieswijk and Sopolinsky are somewhat readable, not greatly readable, but these are much, actually this, uh, the notes from this Hooch's, uh, this conference are much more readable than the original papers. And the appendix of this paper by Rosenbaum et al. is actually really good. It talks a very simple, gives you a simple description of the system. Mm -hmm. And here are a couple other papers that I'm just going to list. Okay, I know I, I went a little bit over time, but I hope that it's okay, was, Chris. So, yeah, uh, give you a good overview. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Uh, Doctor Kamen Park asked. Uh, could there be a way to experimentally determine the scaling, for instance, by considering yes, how yes, different yes. neural membranes are, something like that? Yes, yes, yes. So this paper right here, Synaptic Scaling Rule Preserves Excited Inhibitory Balance and Salient Neural Network Dynamics, uh -huh. this particular paper actually shows that at least in... Um, it's not cortical tissue, it is cultured tissue, but at least in cultured tissue, you get exactly the scale, mm -hmm. almost exactly the scale that you, that you suspect. It's a little technical on how they did it. And, you know, I, I, you know, there's a couple kind of questions that I still actually have about, mm -hmm. you know, when you have an actual network, what does the scaling mean, right? How do you make it? But they, they kind of did some clever things to really, uh, to really kind of talk, to really get at that question. Okay. Good uh, question, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> so, and I, yeah, I have questions. Yeah, I so, uh, yeah. So um, uh, I I think uh, the the uh, if you want to a uh, balanced network, uh, there's uh, another important uh, property of uh, neural network, which is uh, correlation uh, condu conduction delay. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So conduction delay is also important feature to make a balanced network. So, uh, what about what about uh, the, so did you did you consider it or delay? So delays yeah. are so whether including the, so I, I I don't know the literature that well on delays. I mean conduction delays are certainly there, um, and they. Uh, they, I, you know, the in the neural networks, especially in the regime where where you receive balance, I think they actually become pretty important. I have read a couple papers, but I can't think off the top of my head. I think things work out okay, but uh, you usually uh, it's you usually get these issues that with delays you can get into oscillation. You can get oscillations sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so uh, since the network starts. Uh, um, 
responding very quickly. I think you have to wor work carefully with the synaptic time scales and mm -hmm. uh, the delays to make things. But this is kind of a, a little bit, I don't remember exactly what the results of those papers were. Mm -hmm. And there was a question mm -hmm. about, didn't you scale J by square root of N in your model? Um, mm -hmm. Did I answer that or? Yeah, yeah, some, uh, yeah, I think so. It's okay. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. basically, okay. Uh, somehow, just for with the, just before uh, network structure synchro synchrony is default, but if we have a balance between excitatory and inhibitory neuron, then we can get that noisy uh, status with exactly, yeah. disturbing cognitive uh, neurons, right? Exactly. Yeah. I see. Wow. Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird thing, right? If you do if yeah. you if you take a network any network if you if you if you grow it and if you divide by by n. Uh huh. You get a very regular synchronous behavior uh -huh. in the network. Uh -huh. But if you scale by square root of n, it's a little more tricky than that. But roughly yeah. speaking, if you scale the networks by square, if you scale the interaction by square root of n, and then you're going to get uh, a uh, you're going to get irregular asynchronous activity, which is much more like the one that you see in the graph. I see. I see. Wow, that's very interesting. So it's uh, depending on the scaling determines the game. Uh, stochastic systems, uh, you could just call it, you could just depending on the scaling, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it really exists on the scaling. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, there's other, there's other scalings actually come up that are more mm. recent. If you have um, different models of synapses, then other scalings come up. And so that's more recent work. It's, it's, it's a pretty interesting subject. Yeah, it goes, uh, it seems like, you know, it seems like a very physics-y kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, concept, you know, the scaling, it doesn't seem necessarily that it has anything to do with the brain, but it actually connects very closely to, to, uh, uh -huh, to what uh -huh. we think, you know, what we understand the, uh -huh. the brain activity to be nowadays. Uh-huh, uh -huh. So, uh, okay. Uh, then uh, any other question? Uh, <coughs> if not, uh, yeah, uh, let me introduce the, uh, Curse me one more time because there are uh, new people in this uh, uh, room. So, uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, oh, by the way, thanks for giving a tutorial, then, Carso. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, welcome to the Biomac Colloquium. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Karesmi Josik as today's uh, Biomac Colloquium speaker. Uh, in a series of landmark studies, uh, Dr. Josik has applied the theory of deterministic and stochastic uh, dynamic system to problems in neuroscience, system biology, and evolution. And Dr. Josik is uh, currently John and Rebecca Moore's professor of mathematics at the University of Houston. And he is also the editorial board of the Siam Journal of Applied Dynamic Systems and Siam Review and Pisca D. And he is also the chair of the uh, Siam Life Science. And his uh, uh, most uh, recent research and the topic of his talk today is uh, plasticity and balance in neural networks. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Josip. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. It's, uh, it's good to be able to, you know, I, I definitely prefer to give this talk in person, but uh -huh. you know, it's good to be able to connect with people across the, uh -huh. across the world in this way. Uh, yeah, I actually opened the wrong talk, but this is the right one now. Uh, okay, good. So uh, I'm gonna talk about plasticity. This talk is gonna have several different parts. You know, I hope that, uh, that you will be able to get away with the, you know, with, with different things depending on your interest. In, interest. One is going to be synthetic plasticity in balanced networks. So this is going to be, if you were here for the first part, I'm going to take some of the theory and ask how the balanced state is, or whether it's preserved. How do you take a, how do you take a theory and you translate it into, uh, into plastic networks, sort of theory of balanced networks. And particularly if you let the synapse strengths change, Will balance persist or break down? Can we develop mathematical tools to answer the questions? The second part is going to apply that theory to homeostatic control of correlations in primate visual cortex. So there's going to be more of an experimental study where uh, we're going to look at the changes in correlations that are due to optogenetic stimulation in the primate brain and look at whether we can explain some of the changes that we see there 
uh, by looking at the types of uh, synaptic plasticity, uh, 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 balanced networks and a synaptic plasticity that we're going to discuss in the first part of the talk. Mm -hmm. And the last part, I'm going to talk about uh, automated discovery of large scale organization and neural networks. So it's going to be a little bit of a change. Uh, they're going to actually talk about the uh, Drosophila connectome, mm -hmm. uh, which is the connectome of the neural network of Drosophila, of a, of a fruit fly. And I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about uh, just automated ways of trying to cluster the different groups of cells in that network and tell you what we find. What we find. Okay. Uh, balanced networks, I gave you a brief overview before. Um, under strong external drive and under appropriate scaling, as we just saw, the network, uh, model networks, and what we also think networks in the brain are going to be in what's called a balanced state where the excitation and inhibition approximately balance mm -hmm. and uh, activity is irregular and driven by essentially noise, right? It's not exactly noise, but uh, fluctuations, I should say, uh, around the baseline. And this has been known for many, many years. I, I, as I go, uh, as we, it's almost, it's getting close to, to uh, 30 years now. And there's been tons and tons of studies kind of following up on this. This is just a few of the ones that are, you know, just kind of pointing out that have used um, balance, you know, as you've seen one in the previous talk, there's some other ones right here uh, that use balance to either in experiments to confirm balance or balance to explain experimentally observed uh, behavior, behaviors or activities in the brain. There's many different types, you know, since the since this was introduced, there's many different types of balance activity. I'm not going to discuss all of them. This was called uh, 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 um, exact balance or kind of sloppy balance, or there's really no uh, accepted terminology. I'm going to talk about, without really going into details, I'm going to talk about the types of balance that we discussed in the previous, uh, in the first half hour here, uh, in the sense of von Brzezik and Sopolinsky, this is kind of the classical balance, right? In that case, as the network size grows, um, activity remains irregular and correlations between the activity of cells in the network drops to zero. Okay, that's kind of what you typically see. So this is the typical activity you would see in a balanced network. It's in an uncorrelated state. Mm. You can also extend the theory by assuming that the network, neurons in the network are not randomly connected, mm -hmm. that they're connected according to some spatial pattern. Mm -hmm. Under those assumptions and other more general assumptions as well, uh, for instance, there's another population that provides correlated inputs to this particular population. You can actually find that, uh, so this is another picture right here where we have correlated inputs to the network. Under those conditions, you can actually create also examples where you're in the balance, but the network's in the balanced state, but the activity is correlated, right? So the correlations are not, go to, don't go to zero, but go to some predetermined value. You can actually compute exactly what the value is or determine what the value is by uh, looking by changing the correlations in the input or changing the structure of the network. Now, spike time dependent plasticity. Spike time dependent plasticity is one of the main ways in which we think that neuronal networks reshape themselves, right? So this is how the synaptic strength, the strengths by which neurons talk to each other, the weights that, that, that in the network are changed due to activity, right? And so they don't just change randomly, they change in an activity dependent way. And um, the typical, what you see typically are, you know, kind of more standard, I should say, state, typically, but more, the most standard types of, of spike time dependent plasticity are the following. If you have a presynaptic spike, meaning a spike in an input, the cell that provides an input, followed by a spike in the output cell, so cell, a downstream cell, upstream cell spikes, downstream cell follows by a spike. Uh, that leads to potentiation. So that would be this first picture right here, right? So that would be the assumption. If you have the opposite, if the postsynaptic cell, the downstream cell spikes before the presynaptic cell, the upstream cell, right? So this is reversed, then you could sometimes see uh, what's called long-term depression, sort of a weakening of the synapse, right? If you see that, that's what's called a Hebbian rule. It's a very classical rule. So this is neurons that's called, you know, goes back to Donald Hamm, neurons that fire together, wire together, right? Pre, post, 
you potentiate a synapse pre, uh, post pre, you weaken the synapse. But these are not the only types of rules that you see. If you, you know this review, you can find many, many other rules. So here is what's called an anti-hebian rule that's also pretty common. It's, it's an example from the electric fish. And it does exactly the opposite of what you what you would see in a hebian rule. So pre, uh, pre then post gives you a weakening of the synapse and the opposite gives you a strengthening of the synapse. So, this, this. so these rules are also, you have to be very careful. They're actually really unstable. The, the heavier rules are unstable because neurons kind of tend to wire together and their, in, uh, their activity increases. And as their activity increases, they wire together even more strongly. It's really a, a positive feedback mechanism that makes the network frequently uh, drive into, into, uh, into epileptic, epileptic activity. Uh, inhibitory plasticity has also been found to, you know, these different forms of uh, uh, inhibitory plasticity have also been found to um, uh, regulate how the network is going to stay in balance, right? So this is inhibitory plasticity, meaning plasticity between an inhibitory and an excitatory cell. So this is a rule the up above, you know, it's a similar type of rule that, that like the one we talked about on the left, it's kind of a, a little bit of a made up rule introduced by Fogels at all. It's in a paper in Nature, um, that uh, that was shown to, if you use this rule, if you provide input to the network, it will remain in a balanced state, but it will it will um, maintain kind of an engram of the input, right? So you can kind of preserve an engram of the input in the activity of the network uh, and recover that uh, engram. Someone remembers the input, by re but remains in a balanced state. So what we asked is, but you know, this paper here and you know, our following papers really didn't have a theory of, of uh, how, whether a, a, a network is going to remain in balance or be kicked out of balance due to plasticity. And so that's, that's what we asked, right? So we asked, uh, can you extend the mean field theory, the type of theory that we talked about in the previous slides on, or in the, in the previous part of the talk, can you extend the theory so that it also includes uh, synaptic plasticity? So that it also includes changes in synaptic strengths. And in particular, can the theory predict when the network is going to remain balanced or when it's going to become unstable? Right? So that's kind of what you want to know as a, as a, as a very, very basic thing, right? Can you, does the theory tell you uh, if you allow synapse strengths to change according to one of these rules, is the whole thing just going to blow up? Are uh, synaptic strengths just going to go to, or is uh, activity just going to go to zero? Or what else is going to happen? Or it's going to become, is, it, are, is the activity going to uh, become synchronous or what else is going to happen, right? All right, so for that, we're going to use exactly the type of network model that we talked before. We're going to have a group of excitatory inhibitory cells and uh, uh, an input, the input right here, uh, that's again, uh, something that's really important in these balanced networks model. The input here can be uncorrelated or correlated. If it's correlated, it, can, uh, it will induce correlations in the population of blue and red cells right here. So that's one way to control the correlations. Uh, it's just a simple way to do that. So that's what we chose. Uh, this is the connectivity matrix that you see here, right? Uh, you have uh, uh, about one quarter of the cells are uh, inhibitory, two, two, uh, um, three quarters of the cells are excitatory. So you, the uh, connectivity matrix con con uh, consists of E to E of a big E to E block, an E to I, I to E block, and an I to I block. The uh, connectivity strengths, the superscripts correspond A and B correspond to uh, the population. So A stands for E or I inhibitory excitatory, B stands for E or I inhibitory, and J and K stand for the actual uh, neurons. So this is the synaptic strength between neuron K, right, presynaptic neuron K and postsynaptic neuron J. So this is from K to J, right? It's, it's reversed, it just makes things a little bit, the mathematics a little bit simpler. Uh, I kept it the way we did it in the paper. All right. And again, scaling of one square root of one over square root of n, as we talked about before, that's really important for balance. If you do that, you can just average these quantities of an entire network, and you can find the mean recurrent weights. You can you can use these to compute the mean recurrent weights. It's just the average strength of the inputs between two excitatory cells, between two excitatory and an inhibitory cell, inhibitory and excitatory, and so on, right? And the same thing with W bar X, that's the mean feed forward input. This is this part right here, the mean input of the excitatory population to the excitatory, sorry, the, uh, of the uh, external population to the excitatory cells, of the external population to the inhibitory cells, right? So same way. And R are the mean firing rates of the excitatory cells and the mean firing of the inhibitory rates. And what I didn't tell you about, what, what's, what's actually a consequence of the um, balance theory, of the, uh, of the 
that's just a small computation that you can do in the balance state is that as the limit of number of the number of cells goes to infinity you can find this mean activity of the excitatory any inhibitor population using a very simple equation that relates it to the feed forward input rx uh -huh. and the uh recurrent weights the mean recurrent weights and the mean feed forward weights and this does a really go good job of describing how strong the recurrent activity is and i, ha I have a question here so does the actual distance between does the question the yeah that's a, that's a very good question so does the distance between excitatory and inhibitory cells matter it doesn't in this case in the on one of the models it is it did there was a kind of a distance dependent footprint that uh, in which case you get some correlated behavior in, but in these models i'm not going to assume any spatial structure but that's a very good question and you know certainly uh in more realistic models you would want to include some uh, some distance dependent structure because there is a distance dependent structure in, in the cortex. Okay. Uh, what is it getting coded? Oh, so, so there's no, I'm not, so, again, good question. What is it getting coded? I'm not talking about uh, right now, I'm just talking about activity in the brain. I'm not talking about any encoding or decoding of, of any stimuli, right? I'm just talking about what is the activity of this particular, you know, uh, model of cortex and how does it, what happens to the activity as you allow the synapse strength to change with the activity according to one of these rules that we talked about before, the, uh, let's say, Hebbian, anti-Hebbian, the Fogel's rule, or any of the other rules that we talked about before, right? Does, it, does the activity blow up? Does it stay, go to zero? Does it stay balanced? Does it not stay balanced? Is that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah, I think you can go ahead. All right, yeah, I, yeah, I just saw, okay. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, okay, so we can also, we also talk about, we can talk about the correlated balance state. I just, just briefly, well, this is something I'm gonna mention. Uh, as I said before, you can introduce correlations in a presynaptic, uh, in the inputs to the population. This is the covariance of the, um, of the you can compute the, the covariance of the uh, response. So this is the covariance of the, between the excitatory activities. Uh, the uh, activity of the excitatory cells, uh, excitatory inhibitory cells, and so on. It's going to be a symmetric matrix, of course. And you can actually find this is a nice paper by Baker et al. in plus combi. You can actually find also an expression for this covariance, right? That's it's a, derived in a similar way. But you can analytically actually express the covariance in this network. Okay. To in implement plasticity, what we use are eligibility traces. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you think about it, if you just have spikes, Right, one spike occurs in, in at least in a in a leaky token fire model occurs in an infinitesimal amount of time, and if you have two spikes that occur you know at some time apart, and they both occur in infinitesimal at, at each occurs at an infinitesimal uh, time, each takes an infinitesimal time. How do you relate them? Right, and the eligibility traces are one way to do that. So the eligibility trace, it's, a, it's just the spike train. You just take a spike train, SJA is a spike train of one of the cells, and you convolve it with a semi-exponential function. The semi-exponential function is zero to the left, uh, zero for negative numbers, and an exponential function for uh, positive numbers, right? You just convolve the, the, the uh, spike train with that function, and you get effectively, every time you get a spike, this increases by a unit in this case, decrease this back down at the time scale given by uh, tau stdp here that's a time scale it just determines that and another spike it jumps back by a unit and decreases again if there's no spikes for a while you get exponentially k back down to baseline and that's an ex that's a that's an eligibility trace it's simply a convolution of the spike train with an exponential filter with an exponential uh function so how do you use that to get a classical, for instance, as a model of a classical uh, heavy plasticity? What you can do is you take a, um, the um, this eligibility trace, right, in response to a single spike. Spike in now you, you have two excitatory cells here. We're looking at the strength of the connection from K to J, right? So K is the presynaptic cell, J is the postsynaptic cell. This is the eligibility trace that you get in response to a spike in the presynaptic cell, right? And we have a spike here in the postsynaptic cell, right? So what we can do here is we can multiply the two. We can multiply the two, right? 
Uh, the further apart the two are, the further apart these two spikes are, the smaller the product is going to be, mm -hmm. right? The smaller the effect is going to be on the weight here, right? The closer they are apart, the closer the spike in the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cell are, the, clo the, the larger this product is going to be and the more of an effect it is going to have on the postsynaptic cell, on the, sorry, on the weight between the synaptic weight between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cell, right? So this is the pre versus post, right? We can do the same thing for uh, the opposite. We can pair a eligibility trace in the post of the postsynaptic cell, right? The eligibility trace of the postsynaptic cell with a spike in the presynaptic cell, right? If you have a Hebbian rule, this will typically lead, so this is pre happens after post, we will expect that to uh, cause a, a decrease in the synaptic weight between K and J, right? Cell mm -hmm. K, the, post the pre synaptic and post synaptic cell. And so this multiple, and again, it's going to depend about how, uh, on how far these two are apart, right? And so getting these eligibility traces, the accessory eligibility traces, multiplying it by the spike trains of the either the presynaptic or postsynaptic cell, depending on which order the two are, mm -hmm. you can get effectively what is an um, eta EE is just a time scale. You can actually absorb this time, this term. We put it in explicitly because you can assume that the synaptic changes are small, right? That the effect of every pairing is actually going to be really small. Mm -hmm. So we can use a separation of uh, variables eventually. So eta E is going to be a small number. Uh, but if you do this, you get exactly, you recreate exactly the classic Hebbian rule. Right with these with these eligibility traces, uh, pre versus post is going to result in the potentiation, and post versus pre is going to result in a depression of that synapse. Mm -hmm. okay. Very very classical idea. It's a nice way, uh, you know. You can ask uh, what uh, is there evidence for eligibility traces? There is some evidence for eligibility traces, uh, although they are not, certainly not as mathematically simple as the ones that I'm describing here. This is a mathematical simplification that, that works for other convenience. The nice thing is that <clears throat> the reason to do this is that you can actually, with a simple formula where you just, uh, it, which includes all the combinations of eligibility traces and spike trains up to second order, up to second order interactions between eligibility traces and spike trains. With this, you can describe a large amount of different synaptic rules. I don't want you to read all this. This is actually unimportant, but this is the way you can define these coefficients in these, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you care about a particular rule, you, you want to read it, but uh, you know, I, I don't expect you to kind of read and understand this in, 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 a, in a couple of minutes. But the main point is that many, for instance, the classical heavy or the classical anti-heavy and the homeostatic inhibitory that we talked about before, Oya's rule, which is another famous rule, Cohonen's rule, are all can all be put in this particular form, this abstract mathematical form. So all these different rules that have appeared in different papers over many, you know, dozens of years, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, uh, d different decades. Uh, and have been using, for, has been some of them which have been actually uh, uh, verified in biological systems can be put into this particular framework. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use this because you can now, you, you don't have to actually, we, what, we, what you can do is you can develop a theory with this general type of plasticity, right? And then if you want any, you know, if you want to apply it to a particular type of rule, you just choose the particular coefficients that you want. And, you know, the theory just gives you a prediction, right? You don't need to develop a different theory for every different, every different um, uh, plasticity rule out there. Right, it just covers a bunch of them. What it doesn't cover is triplets. So triplet interactions, we have three different spikes that interact. You would need a triplet. You would need a third order condition right here, and that is uh, that does it's not covered by this. But um, yeah, that's just the. Uh -huh. All right. So um, just a brief way of how do we close these equations? So remember, these are the um, uh, these are the firing rates that we get. Right, this is the expression. If you this is a couple of slides back, this is the expression that you get for the firing rates. So the average fi excitatory inhibitory firing rates it relates it to the average weights and the average input weights, and the average input rates in the network. These are the average. This is the co these are the covariances in the network, which are similarly related to the average uh, uh, weights in the network. Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, this is the mean. This is how the weight how the weights in the network evolve. Okay, what I've done here is uh, kind of 
brushed a lot of details under, uh, under the rug here, but I've, uh, if you, when you average the equation right here, right, you'll see that two terms emerge. You'll get this first term that, and part of the second term that depend on rates only, and the second term which, could, which depends on correlations in the network only. You can kind of see this, this is a product of two, uh, of, two of the, of the uh, eligibility trace and a spike train. So this should kind of give, bring into play the covariances. This, dep this depends only on the, uh, on the firing rate of either presynaptic, postsynaptic cell. And this should depend, this should bring into, uh, into play the rates. And part of this term also brings into play the rates as well. Like again, sweeping a lot, lot under the carpet here, or you know, just uh, uh, not going over the entire derivation. But the the uh, change in the average synaptic weights between population A and population B, so A and B stand for excitatory inhibitory here, uh, depend on in a nice way on uh, on, a, on a way on this synaptic rule in a way that you, should, you can actually compute, right? So this is all computable. Mm -hmm. So here is how this theory works. You would you have these two expressions that relate the weights. To the rates, right? So this gives you, if you know the weights, you can determine the rates. This expression right here allows you to get the covariances from oh. the weights. Nice. Okay. You can plug these into the right hand side right here, uh -huh. into the right hand side, and get and determine how the weights are going to change, right? How the weights are going to change. We, we do a quasi steady state approximation. We assume Mm -hmm. that the weights are going to equilibrate, mm -hmm. right? And once the weights equilibrate, right? The weights equilibrate, you find a new weights and you plug them back in here, right? Back, you find a new weights, you plug them back into the equations that then determine the rates again, right? So, you, and you do this, this is a typical quasi steady state types of approaches. In, in a, I explain it in a discrete way, right? You have, you, we know that the weights, determine the change, determine the rates. The rates and the covariances determine the changes in the weights, the JABs are the weights. Now, then once you get, once you let these uh, equilibrate, you get the new values and you plug them back into the equations that determines the covariance and rates and you just kind of do it in iteratively in a circle. Right, and this can be done. You can take the continuum limit. This can be done in a, in a uh -huh. case as well, right? But this gives you this. Uh, the The reason this works is because the weights, these weights, change at a different time scale than the rates. The uh -huh. weights change very, very slowly compared to the rates, or uh -huh. you know, slowly enough compared to the rates. If they don't, then this doesn't work. Okay, classical theory. So the theory works really well, right? So here is an asynchronous and a correlated states. Uh, we use Cohonan's rule. It's a rule that's been used uh, in self-organized maps of biological networks. Uh, there's some evidence for this particular rule. It's just the one that we chose. You can do it with many any other, of the other rules. As I said, this the nice the nice thing about the theory is that you can apply it to any of the rules, right? And so, as n goes to infinity, so the dashed line is the theory, and everything I'm going to show you. The dashed line is always going to be a theory. The solid lines are going to be predictions of the of the uh, sorry the numerical uh, results, uh -huh. and as the network size grows, the theory and the um, numerical uh, results you know tend to tend to get pretty close together, right? Uh -huh. And so here is a correlated network. The covariance of the network is well predicted. The firing rates are pretty well predicted by the theory, and the this is the equilibrium excitatory weights which approach the predicted state pretty well as well. Right. So you need pretty big networks to do this. You need uh -huh. you know, networks of about 10,000 cells. And that's where we stop. Presumably, if you go back to, uh, to 100,000 cells, you'll do it better. Uh -huh. What you can also do is ask, for instance, in a Cohonan's rule, a Cohonan's rule is kind of like a semi-Hebian rule. It has one part, which is Hebian. This is this part that's oh, anti-Hebian, semi-anti-Hebian rule. And so it kind of stabilizes the network activity. And if you if you make this part, this second half weaker, what you would predict is the network becomes unstable. The theory actually does predict that, right? If you compute the right hand side, you can actually compute the right hand side of this equation, the change between the excited to the change in the weight between excited to cells. You can see that that undergoes a saddle node bifurcation as beta, as this as the this anti-Hebian lobe here is weakened, and the activity in the network should explode. So this was what we asked before. Is 
under is a state going to remain balanced? Mm -hmm. This would say no at the particular value of beta. And that's in fact what happens, right? And so it blows up a little bit before what you predict. And this is you, this is you because what we have is a mean field theory. This is a noisy network and the noise is going to drive that uh, across the bifurcation as before. Mm -hmm. Correlations have small impact. I'm going to, let me skip that because I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, I'm just going to say uh, correlations in this case, most of what works here is determined solely by the rates. You can call, almost completely ignore the rates and you'll get a pretty good approximation of what happens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so this was the kind of the first part we talked about. So can we extend the mean field theory of bounds that was to plasticity? So the answer is yes. We can get a close set of equations using, using quasi steady state approximations that describe the evolving dynamics of the network and can a theory predict when the balanced state is preserved? Yes, I mean, it, it can, you know, it can, it can do so pretty well. And in fact, I've just shown you one type of plasticity, either Cohonan's rule, or uh, I think actually I just talked about Cohonan's rule. I skipped the other ones. And, but you can, there's no reason you can't combine many different plasticity types together. And that's probably what's happening in the brain. It's not just one type of plasticity, different type of synapses are probably undergoing different forms of plasticity. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do we apply this? So. Um, I'll briefly describe this is a, this is still this is under under review currently so it's a, it's an experiment from our collaborators Ariane Andre and Valentin Dragoy's lab at the University of Texas at Houston uh, not University of Houston University of Texas is a different university uh, and so what she did was um, she had a monkey that she trained on on a particular task is a change detection task in, in fact it doesn't really matter because what she did was when the monkey was faced with an empty screen she stimulated uh, the visual cortex of the monkey up to genetically, meaning she used uh, uh, opsins, injected uh, opsins, she prepared a brain in particular, this is, a, this is an alive monkey, she prepared a brain in a particular way and was able to excite the cells in the visual cortex by shining a laser onto them, right? By just shining light onto these cells, you can actually make them fire. Nice. At, at, and, and you shine the laser pulses and that will excite. So what you see here right, is the activity of these cells. Uh, in, 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 in this case, you have these different trials. And as you shine the pulses off this laser, uh -huh. the, the cells that you're recording from, she also has an array from which allows her to record individual cells in this part of the brain. You can see that the activity of these cells with each, with each laser pulse goes up considerably. I see. And what you find, so and that's what you see, right? If the, when the laser is on, the um, the average activity of the cells and uh, goes up by goes up considerably. This is this is um, this is normalized. Zero is kind of the background, right? And and this is nothing really interesting happens as far as the as the activity goes, right? The activity goes up when laser is on, goes back down when laser is off. There's no uh, you know nothing nothing say. But if you look at the correlations, the correlations are relatively high, right, more high, I mean, are positive, you know, significantly positive, it's around 0 0.05. Remember, correlations are never really huge in cortex, right? Mm -hmm. So they're about 0 0.05, well, maybe up to 0 0.1, they go up to 0 0.1. In early trials, in the first like five to six trials, but as the, as you, with more trials, the correlations go down, right? The correlations actually go down. So if something happens in this network, to where you know the, the laser keeps activating these cells, but the firing during at least during the laser on trial, it's a little less clear what happens after the laser's on. But the firing the firing during the laser on phase becomes more and more uncorrelated, right? And so the question: What's what's happening? Right? What's happening with this uh -huh. with this uh, situation? Right? And so this is kind of a typical situation you see for uh, for um, uh, for 154 pairs of one monkey. Right, so you get correlations that are high and then drop over the trials, right? And so it, they kind of drop in a strange way, which uh, kind of seems to be a precipitous drop, which we that that we're not able to explain. But um, and for monkey two, you know, uh, it's an example session, you also see this drop, and all sessions look like that, right? And so the monkey rests, it goes back, the correlations go back to you know high correlations, and then if you repeat it, you can see the same thing, right? Uh, so the next day, the monkey comes, you know, does the same thing laser shine and the correlations drop over multiple trials. So the question is what's happening in the brain, right? And so the correlations are, changes are heterogeneous, right? So this is another way to think about them. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, uh, I'll skip this, but just kind of to tell you, or maybe I'll just go through this. Some of the pairs have the pattern that I've just described and that drives the behavior. Some of the pairs, there's no change 
And for a minority of the pair, there's, a, there's actually an increasing trend, right? So it's not completely uniform, but if you average over the population, the activity that I just described is the predominant one, oh. right? So it's the story, you know, just as usual in biology, the story that I'm telling is not completely, uh, you know, not as simple as 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 all the, as um, the figures I just shown. There's, there's a lot more heterogeneity. There's a lot more going on, probably that we can't explain. But this is what we're going to try to explain is this particular drop in correlations that I've talked about, right? Right. So for to do that, oh, okay. Sorry, one more thing. And another interesting thing with this is that you have no changes during rest, right? So when the monkey is kind of resting, you can induce, you can see where the monkey is not really sleeping, but it's it's almost sleeping, it's resting. And you do the same thing, you stimulate the uh, the cortex during rest, the correlations remain high, right? The correlations stay high in this particular case, right? And they, the, this, the same effect is not observed, there's kind of decreasing correlations that we see in an awake monkey that's not high. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, so those are two things that I can observe experimentally, okay? Mm -hmm. wow. So what we did, was say, okay, what if we have a model that has homeostatic plasticity, right? Can we have a model, the homeostatic inhibitory plasticity? So plasticity between inhibit, where the, where the uh, inhibitory to excitatory synapses are plastic, right? And try to maintain the network in homeostasis, right? That's the only thing that we assume, right? We actually didn't assume anything else, right? And we assume a particular well, I, I should say, we assume a particular form of the homeostatic activity for which there's some support in the literature. Again, inhibitory plasticity is not nearly as well studied as excitatory plasticity. So I to E plasticity is, mo uh, there's a lot less information. There's some information about it, but a lot less than excitatory than, than, than E to E plasticity. So we assume, but in the model, we just took this, we assume that, the, that there is some I to E plasticity and in fact, you can't explain it as far as we could see with other forms of plasticity, but this one seems sufficient. Mm -hmm. And you see that you can, for without really trying too hard, you can get exactly the types of behavior that we talked about before. You have this, uh, the, when the laser is on, right? You have a, a, the inhibitory plasticity is actually not strong enough to drive the activity down during the laser on Part of the trial, right? The laser is just too strong. It just effectively drives the cells as fast as it can. But the inhibitory plasticity is still recruited, right? The inhibitory plasticity tries to keep the network from blowing up, from running away. And it has the effect of reducing the correlations in the network in exactly the way in which we see in experiments, right? And uh, you can actually show without tuning the network also too much with, with some small changes is uh, if you downscale the synapses, which is what seems to happen during rest, right? That's a model of rest, you downscale the synapses, you abolish the decrease in correlations. Remember, there was a decrease in correlations when you have uh, uh, during the awake period and no decrease during the rest period, mm. right? And so the model does the same thing, right? During rest, there's no decrease in the synapses during the awake period. There's a decrease sorry, no re uh, during rest. There's no decrease in the correlations. This is a uh, change in the correlations. There's no change in the correlations during rest, but during the awake period, you see this pretty uh, drastic decrease in the correlations, exactly like in the experiment. So this confirms. So, so what the what the model then tells you is that there's a hypothesis, right? The model says potentially what's going on. Mm -hmm. Is inhibitory plasticity. There's the, the, in, in, the connect connections between the inhibitory cells and the excitatory cells are being potentiated or changed according to this model, and that creates a change in the correlations, right? And so what our collaborator went to do, so Ariane Andre, what you can do, you can find putative inhibitory and excitatory cells. This is a little bit tricky and somewhat controversial, uh -huh. but um, when you look at the uh, when you look at the firing the firing profiles, right? If you record from individual cells, inhibitory cells, according to this theory, will have narrower firing profiles than excitatory cells. And you can say just by looking by looking at the recording of the cells, you can you can um, classify them according to whether they're inhibitory and excitatory. And what you found is that if you look at the uh, the potentiation, it's, it's essentially a measure of how much the, uh, the, uh, the strength between uh, a presynaptic and a postsynaptic uh, 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 cell, how, how much the, uh, the weight between a presynaptic and postsynaptic cell has changed over the course of the experiment, 
You find it if you take two broad pairs, meaning two excitatory cells, two putative excitatory cells, the, this potentiation index is roughly one, which means they're roughly unchanged. Well, the potentiation index between a narrow cell and a broad cell, so this is between an inhibitory and an excitatory cell, uh -huh. that is much higher. That's 1.67 or roughly, right? And so it seems that, and but it's still pretty broad. It seems like that at least some of these cells, the inhibitory connect, the inhibitory inputs to the excitatory cells gets potentiated for at least some of these cells, right? And so, uh, and that's also what you get in these in, in these networks when you look at these networks one by one, it's not all the inhibitory uh, inputs that can potentiate it because of the heterogeneity in the network. It's some of them that are potentiated, some of which are not. So this is very similar to the type of behavior that you actually see in, in the network itself, right? The one thing <coughs> that is, um, that, that's a very strong prediction mm -hmm. is that this inhibitory plasticity is actually much, much faster than what people what people think currently inhibitory plasticity should be. So currently people think that inhibitory plasticity is actually, you know, like I say, is, is very slow. It takes many, many repetitions for a uh, for the inhibition to consider to, to considerably change, right? And so it's it's slow, it's on the order of hours. This predicts that it should be on the order of minutes. Right, that the inhibitory plasticity should really change, could be, you know, inhibition, inhibitory cells could be plastic on the order of minutes, right? So that's a, that's a pretty, I mean, we don't know, right? That's something that the suggests there's really no way we could test it in a, in a live animal, but, um, or that at least during this particular experimental setup. But there is, you know, there is this review in, in the literature, it's a, it's a, a 2020 in uh, current opinions, where it makes exactly this point that says that, um, Slow evolution of hemostatic plasticity is observed in experiments mm -hmm. insufficient to prevent instabilities or originating from heavy plasticity, right? So if you have heavy plasticity, you actually need something fast to keep it in check, right? Something much faster, right? And we suggest that hemostatic plasticity is comp complemented by additional rapid compensatory mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It could be different ones. It doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be some other, you know, things that we don't really know about, but one candidate is rapid inhibitory plasticity, okay? All right, so that finishes kind of the second part of the, it's the application of the theory that I talked about in the first part of the talk. I didn't really talk about the, uh, the I talked mostly about the, uh, the computational modeling, but you can actually also do some analysis, which I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into, into uh, detail here, right? Okay, so the last part I'm going to talk about, it's, uh, I'll try to stay on time. So um, uh, yeah, I don't have that much more, um, is about um, colectomy. So, so um, you know, you, you frequently find papers of this type, you know, uh, that are saying neuroscience is existential crisis, we're generating data, and it's actually not a bad uh, article to read if you, if you, it's a popular article, we're generating, and it, it applies actually not just to neuroscience, it's, it's, I think it applies to biology in general, like we're generating data at such a rate that, you know, the argument is at such a rate that we really don't know what to do with it anymore, right, and so we, the, the, the uh, methods for analysis are really lagging behind the data that we generate, this is kind of the existential crisis right here, and, um, and I'd, I'd argue, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, certainly a challenge, but I think we do, we can, we are able to develop certain methods and make some, you know, make some headway. And so as an example, uh, I'm going to give you this, uh, this analysis that we um, are almost done with, with the, with the fly heavy brain. So the fly heavy brain is the full connectome of about a, I think a little bit more than a quarter of the uh, cells in the fly brain. It's about 21,000 cells. Uh, this is this complicated, you know, this is a big papers in eLife that have, uh, that, have uh, that describe this uh, heroic effort. Many, many years, many people have worked with this. What you get is a directed graph or but in much more detail, you get the directed graph of uh, 25,000 neurons with all, with uh, not all, but there's synaptic connections. Uh, so there's um, 3.5 million edges between them. Right, and you not only that, you know, you can you get the entire reconstructions of the individual cells, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the graph, but you also get exactly what these individual cells look like, where they are in relations to each other. So you can actually get the entire network, uh, the entire actually physiology as well, right? So this is a pretty cool data set. There's a very nice, so I think that version 1.2, I think we're working with version 1.1.1. They have a very nice interface to actually be able to, that allows you to uh, manipulate this data and, and, and work with it. 
All right, so what we asked is, <clears throat> what is one way in which you can automatically mm -hmm. detect structure within the data, right? With not, no inputs, right? no, no kind of looking and digging through the data, but is there some way that at least, at least automatically we just feed the graph to, the, uh, to a particular um, uh, algorithm, can it automatically detect structures? And I'll tell you about structures in, in, in a moment. Really, by structure, well, it's right here. It's, it's by structures, I mean communities. Communities are groups of cells mm -hmm. that are more strongly connected with each other than to cells in other communities, mm -hmm. right? So cells in a community, so a number of edges, the way you do this is by maximizing this index Q. MC is the number of edges in a community. Mm -hmm. uh, the second term right here is the expected number of edges in C if they were randomly assigned, mm -hmm. right? If there, if there was just no structure. Mm -hmm. What you wanna do is maximize the term in the parentheses that would maximize the communities. Mm -hmm. And as you sum it over different putative communities. Uh -huh. Does it make sense? So that if you maximize this, if you find a maximum of this quality Q by assigning uh -huh. cells to different communities C, right? Uh -huh. by, by coloring, let's say you have a graph right here. Here's one potential coloring. You can try all sorts of different potential coloring colorings. Each different coloring is going to give you a different number of Q. The number of colors does not have to stay the same. It could be changed. Each different color is going to give you a different number Q. The one that gives you the highest number is the optimal clustering. That's an NP hard problem, right? That's a problem that you will never solve with even 200 cells. Okay, so that's a really hard problem. But there's many, fortunately, there's many smart people who have worked on this and found have found very good approximate methods to do this. One thing you can't avoid when you do this is what's called the resolution problem. This will give you just the large communities. It will not give you, it will, it will not kind of, it will give you a large scale picture, but will not break up those communities. Small communities are very, very hard to find using that. But what you can do is you can multiply by this regularization parameter, rho C, and uh, take it to, to a power, what we call it, power chi. Chi, you can think of as a, as a tuning on your microscope. As you increase, as you start at chi is equal to zero, you get the old measure of community that gives you just a large communities. As you increase chi, you see smaller and smaller and smaller communities. Okay? Mm -hmm. It increases the resolutions at which you can resolve the different communities, right? It kind of forces, you know, if you go through this, I, I'm kind of getting towards the end of time here, it forces actually to, it, it penalizes large communities and it gives you the more fine grained structure of the network. Okay. If you do this on the fly brain, right? Uh -huh. What you get is at chi is equal to zero, you get uh -huh. eight clusters. Uh -huh. The interesting thing that you get, so this is completely, right? We take the, we take the fly brain network. This is completely um, unsupervised, right? You just give it the network and you run the algorithm, right? With chi is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that the eight cluster that you see at this level of resolutions are actually correspond very well to anatomically meaningful groups of cells. The pink one, for instance, is the mushroom body, which is, which is involved in processing odors in the, in the brain. Uh, the, the little handlebar uh, shape that you see kind of rotating around is if I stop it here, oh, here, right? This handlebar shape that's called the protocerebral bridge, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, uh, I'll, sure. I'll mention it a little, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you increase chi, uh -huh. right, the mushroom body, this is almost a hierarchical, it's not exactly hierarchical separation, but these big clusters will break up into smaller constituent clusters. And these smaller constituent clusters are sometimes identifiable as parts of other anatomically meaningful uh, communities, uh -huh. and sometimes it's not, right? So they can actually serve, you can come back to the anatomists, to the uh, fly physiologists and tell them, you know, is this something that's meaningful if, you know, it, is this maybe you have a hypothesis, but maybe this is something, especially if this is a strong community, maybe this is something that's actually meaningful. Maybe this is a structure you should maybe look into a little bit more. So here's the breakup of the mushroom body in particular. As Kai goes up, uh, it breaks up into smaller and smaller, uh, into more and more subcommunities. Here is the entire brain again. Oh. And chi is equal to 0 0.1. This breaks up into zero uh, into 175 clusters. The uh, protocerebral bridge interestingly stays together. Mm. Right? This is the protocerebral bridge. 
what you see here, I, I think this is what's called the ellipsoid body. I'll show it in the next slide. And, uh, and this is again, at chi is equal to 0 0.25, you see many more stories. So it's now it's a lot harder to, to, you know, to, uh, to resolve what's going on. And at 440, with 444 clusters, four, with 440 clusters, it's actually a lot harder to assign them to anatomically meaningful parts. But what you can look is you can take the individual clusters. Here's what's, what the, uh, the what's, uh, this is the central complex. It consists of the proto-cerebral bridge, the, uh, the fan-shaped body, and the ellipsoid body. So these are three mm -hmm. bodies, just names of the bodies. But it's involved, it's a, it's, this is a very well-studied part of the fly brain. Mm -hmm. And it's involved in integrating information from, the, from different sensory um, uh, inputs uh, and, it, and helps the fly regulate where it's going, kind of figure out its heading. And uh, you know, so it actually know you know, which is really important, which which is one of the most essential things that it needs to do if it's if it's to fly, you know, and if it's just you know, if, it, if for its motion. This comes up as a cluster, right? This comes up as a cluster in in, in the analysis. The the fan shape, sorry, I should say this. Mm -hmm. The fan shaped body, right, comes up as a cluster in our analysis, right? But not only that, <clears throat> you can look. So what I've done here is actually not just um, uh, color the fan shape body, but or rather Alex who's doing this, uh, Alex colored color the uh, synapses onto the or a subset of the synapses onto the cells in the in this particular cluster. Right? So these are synapses onto the cells, and what and then what he did is color the synapses as you increase chi and the resolution of the mm -hmm. entire brain becomes finer and finer he kept coloring the synapses. And what you see is this very interesting layered structure that develops, mm -hmm. right? Again, this is unsupervised, right? You, this is completely unsupervised. You just color them according to the synapses, according to which cluster the presynaptic cell belongs to. And what you see is this very layered structure at different values of chi, right? And, and then it breaks up, the, the, the clusters become too small and you'll lose the structure eventually as chi becomes too big, right? But for a range of chi's, you get a very, you get a very kind of layered structure here, mm -hmm. right? And that is a structure that's actually known, right? That is actually a structure that is this layering structure of the, in the faint shaped body is these layers are actually known, right? They correspond to different types of processing. The, the top layers process information. I think the top layers are somewhat known. They're actually involved in regulation of, uh, yeah, I, I would guess, but they're, they're the, the, um, the bottom layers are less known, right? So this is something that's actually, again, automatically you can uncover structures that are actually known in the, in the fan shape body. And so here's another example, and I'll just kind of go through this quickly, where we uncover this checkerboard pattern right here, as you increase the chi, as you increase the resolution. And this one, I don't know if it's, you know, we talked to, uh, again, fly physiologists, this one seems to be new, it seems to be very regular, but not really understood. At least they couldn't tell us if it's anything meaningful. And I think that it's a lot too regular to be completely accidental, mm -hmm. right? So there's probably something there. It could be something trivial. I mean, it could be that you, they look into it and they find that it's actually nothing or nothing really meaningful, but it could actually be something that's, that's meaningful. So, you know, what am I, what am I saying here? So um, this gives you a way of thinking a large network Mm -hmm. And automatically analyzing and coming up with hypotheses, right? That that you can hand back to the physiologists, to the anatomists, and ask them, look, is this something that's worth kind of investigating? This is a structure that comes up mm -hmm. uh, from that's that seems to be present in this network. It might be meaningful in a particular in in, in, in uh, for the fly. Okay, and I'll uh, actually oh, skip okay. ahead because I'll be over uh -huh. uh, to the conclusions. So uh, a general framework to model the effects of STP on network dynamics. So it was the first part. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the important thing is it does not capture, capture higher regulations, but I, I hope try to try to demonstrate that it does, it, it can serve as a model for actually the homeostatic, for homeostatic processes that we observe and actual awake, awake behaving monkeys or in the same monkeys during rest. Right, mm -hmm. so this, this this particular kind of relative abstract theory can actually be implied, and it seems to work relatively well. Again, to generate hypotheses that will have to be followed up by the experimentalists. And uh, the the last part, which I just discussed briefly, is a way to um, to do automated detection of large scale organization of neural networks 
that can again provide experimentally testable hypotheses that can be followed up by anatomists mm -hmm. or uh, or, or uh, people who uh, know more about fly anatomy than fly brain anatomy than I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one one important part, and that's that's kind of a, I think a challenge to all of us who are going to study different types of connectomes is the connectome is noisy, right? The connections that you uncover are never certain, right? You you can never be certain that a synapse is actually uh, that you're not missing, in particular, you usually missing synapses, right, or some sort or another, mm -hmm. and you can you don't know how many. Mm -hmm. So the question is how 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 strong are your conclusions? given the fact that you do not have full access to the connector. All right, I'll stop here. These are the people who've worked on it. Uh, Alan Akio, uh, uh, who was at University of Houston, uh, who, who graduated a year ago. Uh, Robert Rosenbaum, a US of Notre Dame at UT Houston, uh, experiment, experimental team. And the fly brain connectome is a couple of collaborators in physics at the University of Houston. Uh, Zach Bitcoin and Alex Kunin at the Baylor College of Medicine, and uh, a couple of people that we talked with at Janelia, who were actually on the team who has created this particular connector that, that I've mentioned. All right, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. So, yeah, uh, yeah, please, uh, if you have any question, yeah, please feel free to ask. Yeah, anyone, yeah, you want to go first? Yeah, Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what network uh, did you use to create a neural network model? I know that uh, scale-free network are used a lot for neural network dynamics, and yeah, I wanted. That. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that, that's that's a good question. Um, so. Uh, uh, I, we, we just, cre so the, typically in the balanced network theory, what you use mm -hmm. is, is not scale free. So, mm -hmm. so you can, you can do different things. I mean, it's, it's, there's no more one, but uh, what you typically do is you take cells and you have a particular probability of connection, right? You can either do that or you can have them in layers mm -hmm. and connect them you can, in, in planes and connect them using a distance dependent Connectivity distance, or yeah. connectivity prob uh, connectivity, mm -hmm. connectivity probability. And it's another way of connecting them. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I wonder that uh, what's the degree of uh, uh, node? So you the degree. Use... So it, so uh, so the degree is going to change uh, because as the network goes up, you know, as the network grows, the degree is actually mm -hmm. going to change. So the degrees are typically the probability of connections that we used was about 20%. So in a network of 10,000 uh, 10, cells, you would have about uh, 2,000, a degree would be about 2,000. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you, yeah. yeah. But it's a good question, I mean, yeah, so certainly scale. So there's two scale-free, uh, uh, you can use a, a scale-free uh, uh, weights or a power law on the weights, like a, a log normal distribution on the weights is what <laughs> can be done which we have, it. that's more realistic. A log normal distribution would be more realistic. Or you can use a uh, degree uh, or a, uh, the degree, use a scale free degree distribution as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so both of those are, are possibilities. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? So uh, yeah, Sokju, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I wanna ask you about the, uh, in the first uh, section of your uh, presentation, uh, I think I am a little bit um, uh, hard. I think I missed the part when you uh, described about broad cells and narrow, narrow cells. Was it narrow cells? Oh, oh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Could you like describe so, the definition yes, of them? Sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. So I went over it pretty quickly. All right. So uh, this is uh, somewhat controversial, but um, so. Let me um, actually. I'll just uh, use a, a whiteboard here. I'll I'll sketch. So the idea is that um, is that if you have an excitatory cell, the spike of an excitatory cell is going to be broader than the spike from an inhibitory cell. I'm exaggerating. It's not this much, 
of a difference, okay. right? But this is there is a difference, right? If you actually measure these spikes in excitatory cells, they are broader than the spikes that inhibitor sorry, than the spikes in inhibitory cells. So these are called broad. This would be the broad, and these are the narrow ones, right? And so when you're when you're measuring, when you're re recording from live monkeys, right? What you what not you what, what people that record or me, but people experimentals that record from live monkeys, they they have electrodes that they put in their brains, right? And these electrodes are just you know these are these, they open the skull and then put these electrodes in, in the into the through the surface you know plant them through the surface of the brain, and they can't see what cells they're recording from. I mean you know for at least in in these particular experiments that I'm describing. So you don't know, you just see the activity of a cell, you see, you know, when it spikes, but you can't tell mm -hmm. if it's an excitatory or inhibitory cell, right? Mm -hmm. You just see the activity of the cell, you just see, you know, the activity, you know, spike, 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 you know, uh, but you, you can't tell. So one way to do that is to look at individual spike and spikes and say, is it a broad or a narrow spike and classify them in that or try to classify them in that way. Right, and so uh, in some cases, it's a clear distinction. Again, it's not going to be one hundred percent accurate, but it seems to work somewhat. Again, it's it's. I'm not. This is definitely on the experimental side. So, I'm. I I know there's some. You know, I know that people discuss it. I don't know. It's not. You know, not everybody's going to be convinced. Mm. Does that make more sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, then uh, I'm a little. But curious about why don't uh, why people don't classify neurons. So, are all broad cells are excited to neurons? That's the assumption. Yeah. Oh yeah. The assumption would be that in every broad spiking cell is an excitatory cell, and every narrow spike. You know, that's <laughs> again. You know, as I said, this is a huge oversimplification. There's many types, especially there's fewer excitatory cell types than inhibitory cell types but there's depend on depend on how you classify but uh there's probably hundreds of different inhibitory cell types maybe at least dozens at least dozens right and uh there is a, a question in the chatting room from uh jung yu han so plasticity is uh -huh. a fundamental mechanism for learning and memory so how can we link these things with your balanced network model? Oh yes, yes. So that's a, yeah, that's a that's a very good question, right? And so right, and so my focus here was completely on dynamics, right? I didn't talk about at all about what any computation, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, in the paper by Fogels uh, that I mentioned briefly, which, which introduces it, it, they actually had a, uh, uh, the, the uh, balanced state was kind of the burbling state of the network, right? And the plasticity was used to encode different memories in that particular network in a very interesting way. I, I recommend the paper, it's a nice paper. I, there's no experimental verification of that. So uh, a plasticity, I think, the, the, especially the inhibitory plasticity that I talked about here, may actually not have a uh, function in learning uh, directly. I don't know. I mean, this could be possible. Mm -hmm. It could just be a homeostatic mechanism that keeps the network in a particular dynamic state mm -hmm. that allows for inhibitory, again, sorry, uh, I, I'm going to speculate again, that allows for excitatory plasticity, for instance, mm -hmm. to, to learn to shape the network in a particular way, right? But without inhibitory plasticity, you could get runaway behaviors and so on. So it could be that some forms of plasticity are just homeostatic, just keep the network in a right dynamic range for it to operate, right? And to process information. Mm -hmm. That's possible, right? And Or it could be both. It, so and that's kind of more of the viewpoint that I took here. Or it could be both, but it could be that that you that they're both involved in keeping a network in the right dynamic range. And they also, shape the memories and you know are uh, uh, take role in learning and so on right but it definitely took took the uh, dynamic dynamic viewpoint here mm -hmm. okay is it okay uh Jung Yu Han the is... let me okay uh yeah any other questions so um uh, of course, is the, the clustering uh, quantification that method is the, the most popular one in the brain or? 
Oh, no. I mean, there is, uh, so there's many different methods, right? That you can mm -hmm. use for clustering. Well, many. Um, so uh, there's the, the main division that I, I'm not a, you know, I, I actually, actually, this is work with Kevin Bassler. He is, he is the specialist on clustering. Um, the other methods that people have used are spectral methods, mm -hmm. right? Um, so spectral methods you can use, they also work really well, right? Spectral methods, you typically need to define the number of clusters that you want mm -hmm. in, in, in a typical way. So you kind of have to come in and say, I want to divide it into 10 clusters, right? And that is, now you can do, you know, you can use certain ways of cross validating and saying, okay, this seems to be the right number of clusters, seems the best number. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of a different, somewhat different approach. Usually as, um, as a lot of network analysis, there is, I don't think there's a best way to cluster. Uh -huh. You know, there is many different ways to cluster that you can use different measures. There's kind of betweenness that you can also use, which I don't think anybody's used in networks of the size. Uh, uh, all of these give you different ways of clustering. Right? If, and if you have a strongly, you know, clustered network, they should all give you the same thing. Mm -hmm. But if you have something that's a little more amorphous, mm -hmm. they're probably going to give you different answers. And the answers are probably going to, you know, depend on the, and mean different things and going to depend on the particular method. That you use. I see. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, any uh, final call for the question? Uh huh. <coughs> then I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's uh, uh, thank the Cresso one more time. So thank yeah, for having me. yeah. Actually, yeah. So far, we didn't do this, but I think uh, from now, I think it would be great. We have uh, some group photo together after the talk, so that we can make this as a history. So maybe Cresso, can you sure. uh, stop?